I'm not going to stand here in front of one of the great wonders of the world and argue about an old movie. I'll go back inside. If you figure out some plan to make 800 bucks last a lifetime, knock on the door. I'll be in there. You're listening to the Keeping Your Money Show with Jamie Westenbarger and Bart Steinler. All right, welcome back to Keeping Your Money Show. Jamie Westenbarger joined, as always, by Bart Steinler. We were talking about the Equifax breach and why taking that $125 in the settlement might not be your best option. If you miss any part of the show, you can always find it on our website. Just go to keepingyourmoney.com. Want to be a part of the show? Want to join in on the conversation? You're welcome to. Our toll-free number is 888-98-MONEY. That's 888-986-6639. We don't take calls on the air, uh, but someone does answer the phone 24 hours a day, and we'll be happy to give you a call back and talk to you uh, about anything. If, you, if you're interested in something we've discussed, or maybe there's something that you think we should discuss, uh, we'd love to hear from you. And of course, we're always available for a second opinion or maybe a first opinion when it comes time for you to look at what you're going to be doing to generate income in retirement. Uh, you can also email us info, that's I-N-F-O, at keepingyourmoney.com. So we've talked about this a couple different times, and it's a concern for us, uh, for the economy. Um, CNBC came out um, to kind of talk about the same thing, and that is companies buying back their own shares. Um, but for the first time uh, since the financial crisis, Companies have given back more to shareholders than they are making cash uh, in cash, net of capital expenditures and interest payments or free cash flow. What does that mean? That means companies are actually using pure debt to acquire shares. Yeah. And, and, and paying back dividends. So right. it has been like historical that when a company pays dividends, that's coming out of their cash flow, out of profit, out of profit. <laughs> That's the whole point of doing it, right? So we're we're we we appreciate the fact that these people have invested in our company by buying our shares. We had a very profitable year, and we are going to take a portion of that profit, which is also realized in good cash flow, and we're going to take that portion of that profit and return it to the shareholders to reward them for investing in our company. Mm-hmm. Okay, when that profit isn't there, when that cash flow isn't there, then the dividend supposedly should be lowered, so that the company stays financially strong and they don't negate their balance sheet by maintaining their dividend. Now, a lot of people buy certain equities because of the dividend, because they want to generate a stream of income. Maybe twenty, thirty years ago, they would buy CDs, but since CDs don't pay much pay very much anymore. They will buy equities that have maybe a two and a half, three and a half, some pay five or six, seven percent dividends. They'll buy a basket of those and then the dividends that those kick off are part of their income that they live on in retirement. Yeah. And and what what's interesting about this is um you know a lot of uh, economists are starting to take note of it and mm-hmm. say this is uh this Concerning. is interesting. <laughs> this, yeah. this is something that um you know literally corporations seem intent on continuing to do this um and it's getting significant a trillion dollars this year um according to Goldman Sachs will be spent on share buybacks. Um funding is coming from a record drawdown in cash available as well as a rise in gross debt and leverage um and, you know, they just talk about the fact that uh, I saw it somewhere 900. Um, sorry, blew past it. 400 and some billion of that trillion uh, this year is purely in debt. Um, you, you know, I mean, there's just there's a significant incentive, really. And it, and it increases with the Fed lowering rates here this last week. And I know we keep hearing about the Fed raising rates, lowering rates, all these other different things. And I know a lot of times... It can be white noise to people who don't, you know, necessarily pay attention to this stuff mm-hmm. all the time. Um, it's going to impact you. It's going to impact, you know, probably will lower mortgage rates again. It's probably going to lower if you have any type of adjustable loans. Um, you, you know, um, th- those types of things will start to adjust. But for corporations, 
it just incentivizes them to be fiscally irresponsible. It, it incentivizes them to take on more and more debt. And some of the balance sheets of some of these companies are a little bit scary. <laughs> they don't look very good. Right. And um, Goldman Sachs actually put out um, a list of some of the ones they thought still looked good. And I couldn't find the ones they said the one that was a list of the ones they were concerned about, tried to find that. But um, there were definitely ones that were mentioned in this article that are pretty common dividend paying stocks that you see in a lot of people's portfolios that Goldman Sachs was starting to get a little bit concerned about. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things that we have talked about before and before on this show is that Something that may have worked a generation ago, something you may have learned from your parents or your grandparents about investing may not be true today. Okay, so we're not saying that, you know, you should get rid of all your dividend paying stocks, but we are saying that you should take a look at them or at least uh, talk it over with your financial advisor. And if you don't have a financial advisor, you should probably call an independent financial advisor and, and have this conversation because if you're carrying, if you're depending on your income from dividend paying stocks and those dividend paying stocks have a weakening balance sheet, there's a pretty good chance that that, that flow of money is not going to work out in the long term. Mm-hmm. The other thing we have to look at with that is, Federal Reserve policy, European Central Bank policy, right? kind of an uncharted ground here. You know, I mean, for for most people would agree our economy is pretty strong right now. Mm -hmm. You know, um, for the Fed to lower rates this week, kind of unprecedented. I mean, in in a strong economy, usually rate lowering is designed for when the economy's in trouble or there's potential uh, issues lurking, a recession maybe around the corner. So for them to do that in good times, you know, my biggest concern is what bullets do they have left in the gun if we do find ourselves two years from now in a recession when every time they try to raise interest rates a quarter of a point, you know, the, the market, uh, you know, responds with, with negativity. I mean, we have to get back to normalized rates at some point in time. And I don't know if, if, you know, where are we? 10, 10 years into a into a bull market. If we haven't gotten to a point where we could raise interest rates a quarter of a point, uh, when are we? Where where do where do we find that opportunity? Yeah, so there's kind of two things that I feel need to be addressed to to be able to un, un, um, give us an environment where those interest rates can start moving up to a more normal area. One, I think is a debt issue and it's debt with corporations that we just talked about. And it's sure. also debt with our federal government sure. because even though they've increased their revenues, they've increased their spending five times more than they've increased their revenues. So if you so, increase the interest rate, you cause huge amounts of debt payments that some of these companies and one could argue even our government would struggle to make payments on. Exactly. The other thing is what's going on in, in Europe and Japan. Um, they actually, and, and Jamie and I were talking about this, and this has been going on for a while, and we, there's, there's parts of it that we just cannot comprehend. But they, have, they actually are issuing bonds at a negative interest rate. And we have no idea why, they would, why anybody would buy those. But because... It literally <laughs> makes no sense. It makes no sense at all. I mean, you'd My be better off... My favorite is the 50-year Swiss bond at a negative rate. Right. So, yeah, we were joking about that when we we're off the air that, you know, if if you're going to buy a negative bond, which I don't know why anybody would, but why we, why wouldn't you not buy a short-term negative <laughs> bond instead of one that goes for 50 years? That's just ridiculous. I just want to hear the sales pitch on that, you know? <laughs> so we have your money for 50 years, and at the end of it, you get less back. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, inflation has eaten up that, that money over that 50 years, and it's worth half what it is today. Yeah, we just want you to know that if you call us, we're not going to suggest that, we, okay? We do not have negative rate <laughs> that is not That is not something that uh, that we will suggest to you. But um, part of the problem is because the European economy and, and the Japanese economy are not as robust as the United States economy, I think the Federal Reserve worries about that, and they worry about the spread in interest rates that we have compared to Europe and Japan as being too large. And I think that's a, an impetus to have them lower it because they, while they don't mind some foreign investment money coming over and buying our bonds, I don't think they want a flood of it. Right. Exactly. Oh, I think there's, there's a lot of moving parts to this and you're right. That's a huge part of it. 
we're just in very uncharted territory on what this looks like. And it could be very concerning if we don't start to get some game plans on how this is fixed. I mean, if 10 years from now, we're still talking about low interest rates, um, you know, the likelihood is we could find ourselves in, in real trouble. So, all right, coming up, we're going to talk about, according to this USA Today article, there's only two things you need to do in retirement to not go broke. We'll talk about why that's absurd and more right here on the Keeping Your Money Show. The ups and downs of a roller coaster are fun for some people, but maybe too nerve-wracking for others. The same is true for the ups and downs of the stock market. If your palms sweat when the market fluctuates, it may be time to reevaluate your investment choices. The ride to your financial future shouldn't keep you awake at night. Call the Keeping Your Money Show at 1-888-98-MONEY to get off the roller coaster and onto solid ground. 